Hey everybody, welcome to the Entrepreneur Experiment podcast with me, Gary Fox. The Entrepreneur Experiment discovers the secrets and systems world-class founders use to build their body, their business, and their brain. Today is special. Today we have a titan of Irish industry on the podcast. To be honest, sitting down with Kaha Friel reminds me how far we've come on this podcast. He is an incredible founder. He has IPO'd multiple businesses worth billions. He's created billions of euro worth of value from nothing. He has worked his way up from having to take over the family business at 16. He was taken out of school at 16 to build his family business out of debt, which he successfully did, and then sold that business before going on to work in finance, stockbroking, and now as a founder, an entrepreneur, and a successful launcher of multiple IPOs. He gives us his full playbook. This is a revealing chat with Cahal. We get his full playbook about how he breaks down IPOs, how he thinks about them, and how he spots new ventures, and why you should never trust a bluebird. This is my chat with Cahal Friel. If you're a regular listener of the pod, which I hope you are, you'll know I've been hosting the podcast from my Conic offices for quite a while now, and things have gone really, really well. So well, in fact, that I'm now a member of Iconic offices, working and recording from one of their spaces. This means I can vouch for the benefits it gives to any business. On that note, Iconic offices have given me a number of exclusive complimentary day office trials for my audience. So try it out for yourself for the day, bring your team, no catches. Simply go to the web link in the description and enter Gary23, so it's Gary23, to claim your complimentary office for a whole day. It's a pretty fantastic offer. Thank you, Iconic Offices. Oh, welcome to the pod. Gary, delighted to be here. It's a genuine pleasure to have you on. You're one of the titans of Irish industry. Wow, titans. A boy from Donegal that came to the big smoke. I wouldn't define myself as a titan. Somebody who's maybe got a little lucky would be a better way of rephrasing it. How about that for an intro there? I, I really big that up for you. A boy from Donegal. What part? Uh, West Donegal. I used to be from uh, a little village called Creaslaw. Ah, my mum is from Ballyshannon originally. Ah, there we go. Donegal so connections. I know it well, yeah. yeah. When did you leave Donegal? Long time ago. Yeah, I can tell. Long time ago, yeah. Where did you go? Um, well, I did actually spend a little longer in Donegal than normal. Family of the business there. My father got a bit ill. I'd leave school and kind of run the business. So I didn't leave Donegal properly till I was late 20s. Uh, in late 20s, I took a year off, went backpacking. Came to Dublin, 98. What was the business in Donegal? We had a family business, a Ford franchise uh, shop and a filling station. And standard Irish business. Standard yeah. country practice, we'd call. Yeah. And uh, again, people talk about the pan, uh, the pandemic and the economic crash. People forget 79, 80, 81, there was a mega crash in Ireland. And uh, yeah, my old man had a bit too much debt and then uh, 81. Yeah, we just don't think it happened today. I saw the bank manager coming into the school. Come here, you. You're coming home because my dad had got a bit sick. He'd gone into hospital and there was a few deaths. So I ended up starting working at 16, immediately post intercert. Wow. Okay. Straight into the, into that business or a different business? No, into the family business. Basically, there was a good bit of debt there. Yeah, he'd been dabbling in property as well, which he thought was a good idea in 79, 80. 81 interest rates went from, I think it was 6% to 16% wow. in one year. So, yeah. So, look, it did no harm. It was kind of amusing looking back. I was pissed at the time. But yeah, I'd start work at 16, dealing with, with half the country, deal with NAMA. I'd deal with a nasty, aggressive bank in 81, 82, 83, trying to figure out how we pay this money back. But it was good learnings. You'd call it getting to get into the kitchen early. It's not funny, though. Everyone thinks this is new, right? Every crisis is new. Everything is new. Everything is new. It happens all the time. Absolutely. History repeats. Absolutely. Like, how many cycles and booms have you seen? Well, if you think, I'm 58 this year. I started work at 16, so that's, yeah, 40, 40 years work. And so every, like, yeah, every seven, eight years, there's something. If you think about it, we've had the pandemic, which was awful. People survived and got through it. We had the 2007, 2008 crisis, which is even more, to be honest, I think it was more awful. More Irish people really got hurt, got made bankrupt. I think so, too. Before that, then, you had the 2001, what we call 9-11. Uh, the dot com implosion. Before that, you had ninety seven international crisis. Before that, you did the long term credit ninety one. They kind of mm. come every five or seven years, and you, you just get used to them. I think. Isn't it phenomenal how short our memories are, though? Yeah, we're programmed not to dwell on the past. I think, which is good. 
We are, but I think you can also learn, right? Clearly, you've studied, you know the score. You've, we chatted over lunch there. You, like, you have a playbook, you have an idea in your head. Like, what is it about business people that are, are humans in general that we just don't think about it? Why is that? Even now, people aren't talking about the pandemic, even though the, the hangover is still coming. Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's probably a self-protection system. Um, if you dwell too much in the past and think with too much in the past, or if you think too much what will happen, uh, you won't do it. Like simple, I think it all comes back from when we came down from the trees. 4.6 million years ago, for some reason, humans became human erectus. We started walking around erect. Our first cousins stayed in the trees, were mostly. And a bit on that is a simple thing, the proof of why we came down from the trees. Uh, why do nobody fall out of bed? If you lie on the very edge of a bed, you never fall out. That's because our DNA were designed to live in nests, flat nests on the top of trees. Monkeys never fall from trees. You never see dead monkeys in the ground, do you? Even though at night they sleep up on the branches. So I think that <laughs> That is something I've never thought about, but now that you're saying it, I can't stop thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> we've, we did, we've a couple of senses. We have a sixth sense. One of the sixth sense is you don't fall out of bed. People can sleep on the edge of a cliff. Lots of rock climbers do it. I used to rock climb once. Broke most of my bones and fingers. You can sleep on the edge of a cliff. You won't fall over the cliff. There's some sixth sense going back to the time we were in the trees. Your uh, body just monkeys. knows. Your body knows, don't roll over there. There's a void. Uh, yeah, so that's where, anyway, how we start talking about monkeys. But risk. So I think the humans who came down from the trees, most of them got ahead. Uh, you run around, there were tigers, lions, snakes. They had to be risk takers. And you had to get into caves to survive. So I think there's something, and again, it's terrible thing, go back and we think you should think about it. monkeys don't take risks. You know, they run away, they hide. Uh, and But something happened 4.6 million years ago that we came down from the trees. So I think most humans are naturally risk takers. Mm. The thing about risk, you don't think of the consequences of too much of your actions. If you do, you'd never do it. And that's the slight difference if you think of some of the really great entrepreneurs, Dennis O'Brien, Dermot Desmond, Michael O'Leary. I don't think Michael O'Leary thinks too much when he orders those hundreds of billions of jets. What if it goes wrong? He just does it. Yeah. He does calculate risk, but if he thought it through, he wouldn't do it. I don't think Dennis O'Brien would ever open his mobile phone business, did you, if he thought it through? You just take the risk and go with it. He doesn't wake up in the middle of the night at three, he's like, oh, made a mistake. So I think that's going back how we started. All humans are risk takers because we did come from the trees. We did sleep in the trees and we didn't fall out and die as monkeys would. Uh, so we have to understand where we came from. And my belief is part of the people who came down from the trees, the human, uh, we call them humanoids or homo erectus, I, we erected, we stood up straight. There's certain skills we had that our friends that still live up in the trees, the monkeys, like we're our first cousins. People shouldn't forget we're the closest relative as a chimpanzee. So, and that comes to food. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so I think, yeah, a big part is entrepreneurs are a little bit more risky. They'll take mm. more risk. And I think when entrepreneurs do the risk bit. We all wake up at three in the morning. You have a newborn child. It'll wake you up. But for most of our life, and you get worried. I think what entrepreneurs do, you wake up at three and say, hmm, this is bugging me. What I do, and I, go, I know a lot of entrepreneurs, they say, right, let's do something about it. I'm upset, I'm worried. You take a piece of paper out, or now we do it on the phone, you type down, right, tomorrow I'm going to make a phone call about this. Tomorrow I'm going to do this, tomorrow. And the fact you've written it down, you've done something about it, you actually go back to sleep, maybe a glass of water, a glass of milk. Yeah. The non-entrepreneurs will twist, turn, twist, turn, and they'll wake up feeling terrible. But I think the entrepreneurs, that's something every entrepreneur I know, you wake up at three o'clock, because we all worry, but to get rid of the worry, um, you write it down and say, tomorrow, and then you wake up in the morning and say, I must make that phone call. Mm. And usually you make the phone call and say, oh, it's not as bad as we think. So that's, yeah. you deminimize the risk. So I think entrepreneurs, you, you just don't spend too much thinking about the risk. When it bugs you, you do something about it. It's a great, great quote. We suffer more in our imagination than we do in reality. I agree. I love that quote. And I love that thing of just doing something because you think about it, think about it, think about it. The minute, it's 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 bizarre. Obviously, the, the mind is incredible. You write it down, dot, finished. Yeah. I think of it as, you know, when you, when you have Chrome, Google Chrome, you have 10 tabs open. I think of that like my brain. At the end, if I'm not closing those tabs at the end of the evening, not going to sleep. Correct. Not going to be able to slow it down. So I think of it as tabs. Just close the tabs and off and just do a brain dump in the evening. What am I thinking about? Get it all out. And the next thing, it's just... Loaded. 
Yeah, and I think on that, I remember going to this long TMI Ireland Toast Trade Time Managers International, gone bust a long time ago. Great name. As a kid in Donegal, a 16, 17 year old trying to run the business. I remember it come up to big smoke occasionally, and one of them was there was a time manager course. I'll never forget, it was Filofax. This was the 80s, it was very cool. But the best thing ever stuck with my whole life. On that two day TMI course, it was all about writing things down, lists, lists, lists. I constantly got lists and you tick them off. But the other thing I remember it said, when you go home, never bring work at home. They say, be like the James Bond character. You leave your bag, your coat, your shovel, whatever it is, the front door, and you come throw, hi, honey, I'm home. And I usually do it all my life. And one thing, I avoid ever working the weekend, avoid bringing, mightn't come home to 10 or 11 o'clock, but when I come home, the bag stays in the car or the bag stays the front door, and that's the critical. And what happens recently, I think I mentioned lunch, if I'm feeling a bit crap and a bad day, just for the half an hour I go home, I de-risk or de-pressurise, have a little glass of wine, stop, have a coffee, or mm-hmm. don't have coffee, in the, but have a glass of wine. And then when you go home, the screaming kids are facing you, and you're like, oh, I'm cool. Okay. And just have that little break. How do you do that? Like you say, physically dropping the bag at the door. How do you mentally do that? Because I think that's, you know, you say it there matter-of-factly, but I think a lot of people actually bring the bag around with them all day and all night and go to bed with the bag and get up with the bag. How do you do that? Yeah, very simple. Uh, in recent years, fortunately, because I'm living out in the south side of Dublin, traffic's bad. So what I've done, uh, I take a taxi into work, I take a taxi home. It's actually very economical because they don't pay for parking space. That half an hour in, you can do a few emails, get your head in gear. Interesting. On the way home, you get your head in gear and you get to wind down. So I think the taxi thing is 20 each way. So for 40 quid a day, I can do far more than sit and get stressed. However, I take the bag in and I religiously leave it inside the Do you mean physically? Door. Are we talking about a physical I, I bag I have a little here. black backpack. Everybody sees me. That backpack goes to, I go to England two days every week, go to Scotland next Tuesday, come back, go to England again Thursday. My little small, very small, pretty didn't bring a tiny little backpack. My kids laugh. Dad, you can actually live in that bag for a week. Mm-hmm. It zips down quite small, tiny little bag. But I have this pad goes everywhere that's my notes and lists uh but i always leave it inside the front door i very once every three or four months i might drag it in the kitchen because there's something that i should do but going back to 1985 i think it had a team manager leave it inside the front door it's there if you need it but never touch it because then that means you'll chill relax you'll sleep you get up the next morning you get your bag and you go and your school books are in your bag but it's a bit like school kids coming home like put the spool bag away and sit down and watch tv that's absolutely brilliant like because it's so obvious we all are glued to like our laptop our ipad our phone whereas that's just so obvious of what you just said but everyone just drags around they're on the phone they're on the ipad what about the laptop ipad don't do, do laptops have an ipad a lot of emails and again it's at the door and I've gained a policy, kind of, now to annoy some of the staff, I do do emails sometimes late at night and early in the morning I go for a walk. But generally when I come in, most of my emails are not iPad. So rather than having the stress, oh, 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 it sits inside front door. So nine of the ten nights, I wouldn't go near it. From mm. But I would be monitoring emails because of a few different businesses on my, on my uh, fairly large uh, iPhone. But I just scan them. I wouldn't do many replies. But this idea of spending time work. I just think, as soon as you come through the door, it was about 11 o'clock last night. I had a lovely hour chatting to the older kid before he went to bed. But the bag stayed at the door. And then we come down in the morning, you're going out, you lift your bag. So you mm-hmm. don't have this anxiety, oh, yeah. should bring the bag home. Bag comes home inside the front door. Just having a code, having a, having a rule. I think even that, just installing yeah, rules and a little rules. code to yourself. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise, it's just, uh, you're always on. Mm-hmm. Shannon, to a previous guest about this, always on. 50%. You're always on at 50% and that's useless because yeah. you're just burning out yeah. consistently. You're all at 50 You're never getting 100% out of you. And that's why, look, weekends, I have this rule in the office. Most of my life, I've been working now 42 years this November. Um, I never do weekends. Everybody should have a day or two in your life if you work weekend shifts. So I have this thing. Now, occasionally, there'll be drama. I'll have to read something. It'll be in the bag. I'll go to the front door, lift the documents, bring it in, put them back out to the front door. I won't have the documents lying around, uh, annoying me all weekend. Mm. But most of the time, everybody should get their weekend off. And if you have young kids, you have, I have. I call it a very understanding wife. Five days a week, she gets lumped with the bulk. But 
Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, Monday morning. I always bring the kids to school Monday and Friday all my life. Make sure I do that one time. It's easy doing Friday morning if I'm around. It's easy doing Monday. But the weekends, I love the weekends because a complete switch off. Mm -hmm. And like if you're mine in three, 10, 12, 12, 10, 13 year old and 15 year old, you don't get much time to think about work. And it's almost like if you haven't got kids, physical labor, physical sports just gets you out of the zone. And the more tired, I always say, oh, I come to work for a rest on Monday morning. I'd yeah. love going to work then. But I love going home on Friday night. So it's the variety. You recharge in reverse, right? You, exactly. You, they, they're both recharge you in different ways. What, what are you working on right now? Because like it's, it's, it's brilliant. We're like we're 13 minutes in. And we haven't really talked about business, which is beautiful. I love that. Cool. Okay. Well, look, work. I would be. I'd be very happy to say I'm a jack of all trades, but a master of none. Or really, to be professional, I'd call myself a financial entrepreneur. Oh, yeah, uh, I like that one. Working 42 years, I've done loads of things from running the family business in Donegal. At one point, Ford franchises are awarded to an individual. So, as a 16, 17, 18, I was the youngest Ford dealer ever appointed in Europe by default because somebody had the sign. Ford franchises are never given to a company then, has to give an individual. Oh. So I've got a, a bunch of different, but the most enjoyable piece is 2000. I met some of the guys who set up Marion Stockbrokers. They kind of brought me in as a stray. They were all ex-NCB guys. I was brought in as a sevens director and as somebody who could do deals. <laughs> never been through a stockbroker in my life. So I spent seven wonderful years in Marion from 2000 to 2007. It got sold to an Icelandic bank, and then I s took the corporate finance team and ran Raglan. But the reason that's important, that has set the rest of my life, those seven years in Marion, because I suddenly became a financial person, even though I had no... What were you doing business. before? Before that, I was helping run a software company here in Dublin for two years, uh, so it was a software. Before that, I had a software business in Belfast, and before that, I was running the family business in Donegal. Right. And then for five years in between, I double tasked, I'd, because I had to go to university at night, because I... Uh, didn't do a leaving cert, run the family business. But I went back and lectured to piss my older brothers and sisters off. They all went through university. They all got their degrees and masters. And I said, well, I'll show you. So I lectured for five years, 1990 to 95, in the University of Ulster. And again, they were wonderful. Why run on my own business? Why did you go back to college? Or why did you want to study? Oh, I think the critical thing in life is education brings freedom and brings choice. Um, I just think, even though I learned the hard way, uh, unfortunately, it wasn't my idea to leave school at 16, but was a bank manager. I thought it was, I've met him a few times since. He's, oh my God, if that happened today, I'd be in jail. But he actually came to the school, public school at Clotney and Falcara. Son, you're coming home. He knew me because I was always handy around the business and right. he was friendly with my dad. But imagine the day what would happen if a bank manager came to the school, took a 16-year-old out. <laughs> He'd be on the front of the Irish Times tomorrow. Exactly. It was all friendly. He had permission from my parents to do it. When you say he brought you up, was he installing you going, right, look, we're installing you here as the head it lad? It wasn't dissimilar what happened in 2007, 2008 with NAMA and so many businesses in the countries where the bank might say, listen, you do this, you'll do that, you owe us money. That's how banks work. But they were getting you to work off the debt, essentially? Yeah, exactly. Okay. It was either that or he took possession of the family home and the family business. So it was very simple. There was some discussions now beforehand for the week or two. My dad was in the hospital, my mum. Well, who's going to deal with the bank? And there was a few bank meetings. But I remember seeing this car driving up outside the school window. I won't mention his name. I said, what's he driving into the schoolyard? And they said, I'm coming in the door and finger. It was it. Look, it didn't. It, at the time, I hated it. I had the three worst years of my life mm. then because I could see the bus going to school every day. Uh, and my did you like it? Did you like being in school? I I love school. I absolutely ah, love weird. school. Okay. Uh, but I but I hated it. It was just one of those things that happened. But I remember three years, and we cry my eyes out at night. How the hell will I escape this vicious circle of dealing A lot of pressure banks. for a 16-year-old. Well, actually, 16-year-olds are fairly resilient, I think, when you throw them True, into the deep actually. end. Yeah, yeah, you don't know what you don't know. You've got all yeah, that Yeah, you're fairly resilient. Yeah. And then there was benefits. I basically had a car, even though I wasn't supposed to be driving. I sort of. Then, if we recall, uh, you only had to write down your date of birth in the driving license application form. So really? I, I basically, yeah, probably might have. Because I started behaving as an 18, 19 year old, even though I was 16. So I might have been a fully fledged driving license a year or two before I was, might have been 17. <laughs> but <laughs> it did say I was 17. So. A, Ford driver, a, Ford, uh, a Ford model holder without a, exactly. without a license. Yeah. Okay, a Ford dealership holder. So when you left the family business, went to Dublin, you went, you went traveling? 
took a year off uh, to make up for I always felt hard done by I never got more than two weeks holidays in my life and had older brothers and sisters who had the summer off two three months four right. months even some of them often did one of them did a PhD which I thought was going to be a lovely he had a lovely dossier five or six years while the family business had to pay for him because uh, he was on the payroll a family member um, so I just thought I always felt hard done. I could never get more than that. You know, when you're running your own business mm. two, three weeks in a year, even currently, it's two, three weeks, yeah. that's it. Yeah. I had this ambition, I would take a year off. So yeah, one Easter, Monday, 1997, I finally got rid of the family business. I'd done my five years lecture in University of Ulster. Again, the lists, I wanted the, I'd sold the family business, paid the debt back, um, put it in safe hands, done my five years lecture, and uh, I said, Time to take my year off. And literally, I had a poor girlfriend. Felt sorry for her. She was thinking she was getting engaged and said, listen, honey, remember that year off I was talking about? I'm leaving next week. And it took off Easter Monday, 97. Bought one of these round the world tickets. Uh, headed off, backpacking through Africa. Back, and literally backpacking. It was the year off. There was, it was, but the great thing about backpacking, you meet wonderful, amazing people on the backpacker. And then Good Friday, 98, came back and decided when I left, I'd come back to Dublin. Arrived in Dublin, Easter, Tuesday, 98. Knew nobody, because I was basically based between Belfast and Donegal. And sent out a lot of letters. Uh, did a lot of job applications. And eventually got a job in the software company. Cause what I what really did you want to do, though? Because you'd, ha you'd had a very unusual background, right? Yeah, you know, we're a family a business, lecturer. And this, again, back to the entrepreneur of the list. Looking back, I wanted to get into the software business in Dublin. And most Why? people laughed at me. I just thought it was cool. Bear in mind, 97, 98 was a dot-com boom, was full steam. Okay. You had a thing going in Dublin called Wireless Wednesdays and First Tuesdays. It was great. So I turned up in Dublin and set myself a target. I'd sent out CVs. It was, wasn't, email was only getting going. So I'd send a letter, 10 letters every day to loads of software companies. Turned up, met them. They say, yeah, Carl, you don't have much experience. Nice to meet you. And eventually, after six months and about, I would say, about 200 interviews, people met me because the letter was kind of curious and unusual in the background so I had a lot of interviews but it was a fabulous I met a good few hundred people in Dublin who had never met before so that was my network and eventually I got fed up being turned down so I met a guy called Jim Marr in all finance I said Jim I really want to work here he says you don't have any experience in software I said, I'll work for free for six months he's oh what I said yeah free so I worked for free for six months and after five months he's called we better pay you something and within a year he made me deputy CEO so that's where I cut my teeth in the Dublin software community. I got very involved in the Software Association. And about two, 2001 or two, a couple of years later, I was chairman of the Irish Software Association. So then I was pretending to be a software person. Got bored in that, got into corporate finance in Marion. And since, ever since Marion, I've been financial ish. You financially minded? Obviously, you are. But yeah. is that what you studied? I uh, did an MBA at night, so yeah, it'd be kind of... I'd be more engineering, scientific, because at school, before I had to leave, I would love science and engineering. That was my favourite subject. But I would be... I don't have a country qualification, but because I worked in, in Marion for six, seven years, then worked right. You pick up finance, and they go, oh, you learn it. We had a lot of very good accountants with some brilliant financial experts working for us in Raglan at the moment. So you kind of... they. They do the hard work, but mm. I know I'd be financially literate, is the way they put it. You worked for free for five months. Absolutely. I was back from a year off, and I put out my CV, and even that, people were saying, you're 33 or 34, you've just done a year off. They were kind of curious. I used to these, uh, a copy and paste, these amazing two-page letters, why they should interview me. Most got a lot of interviews, but then they couldn't pigeonhole me, and I wouldn't say what I wanted salary-wise, so thanks, but no thanks. But anyway, I eventually got bored. I said I'd work for free with Jim Marr and all finance, and after five months, he's called, we got to pay you something. So five months is chunky. Like, we ever kind of going, oh, I think I might have met, well, no, met so the a benefit of, this. of having sold the family business. I did have a few quid. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. I did that makes more sense off. now. Okay. And my year off was very cheap. I backpacked the whole way around the world. I'd say I spent in the year off 15, 20 grand. I would have like Vietnam, Laos, For a year. on two quid, uh, two, two euros a day or something. It was like, but it's great fun. Backpacking is absolutely very very character building and when you were working free what did you want what did you were working for free you wanted a job but what was the what was the goal what well was the this is back to my lists i'd come back i wanted to get to know a lot of people in dublin i decided the option to get the hell out of donegal so i shouldn't say i have a donegal but i want to get out of there so you made a list of goals was yeah it? and one of them was i want to move to dublin i want to get into the software industry 
minor problem with no software experience. Mm. So I met an awful lot of software people. None of them would offer me a job. So I said, right, I'll work for free. And the first guy said that, right, you've got a job. So that got me into software. A few years later, I decided I wanted to get into stockbroking. And again, uh, Why? I just because I thought that was the action was. I like following the action. It seemed like dot com, 97, 98, the software industry in Ireland was on fire. It was hot. But a few years into it, I decided, hmm, financial services seems more interesting. Or stockbroking. So there I made a point and met a few of the stockbrokers and then got lucky that one of the Marian guys who I, I reached out to him. And this big thing in Ethan, I don't wait. I always reach out for his business opportunities, finding people. And cut a long story short, Marion Stopper was just set up. John Conroy met him, uh, said I want to work for him. He was kind of, hmm, okay, interesting. Doing what? Uh, something. I don't want to be a stockbroker. That's what I'm saying. You yeah. went to the stockbroker, but not to be a stockbroker. So what did and you yeah, do? Within stockbroking, the interesting part, there's two arms. There's one part stop on buying and selling shares, but the other part of stock is corporate finance. So I said I want to be in corporate finance. And it was just really lucky. No, most people laughed. Our friends in Davies, good buddies laughed. So hang on, Kyle. You're some software guy with some unusual CV. You're not getting the job here. But John actually said, well, hang on, you've been involved in family businesses. Yeah, like he's, would you come and meet the corporate finance guys? You might put a bit of energy and enthusiasm into them. So he brought me in, and within six, nine months, I was helping run the corporate finance team. What's corporate finance, the person on the street here? What does that mean? Yeah, that's the guys who, when you want to buy your company or sell your company or raise money, they'll do any finance to do with a corporate entity, hence the name corporate finance. So any you do with the corporate company finance. So we usually go to the corporate finance guys to sell your company, to buy a company, or to raise money. So in Marion Stockbrokers, the corporate finance arm, I helped run it, and it was great fun. But ever since... That has now helped me raise money, build companies, because entrepreneur finding money is that you have to have drive, just go do it, but you do need to have some way of finding that initial seed cash, and that would be the probably the most important thing in every entrepreneur's journey. How do you get the cash to start? So what did you go in doing then? You were looking for deals, closing deals. What were you doing day to day? Luckily in Marion, they had a huge deal flow because it was 2001 and the dot-com boom was still flying. Starting to roar. Yeah, yeah. Tiger and starting they, to get they, going. They come in here, give us a hand. And part of the mandate was they had too many deals and John Conrad said, could you try and shut down the fundraising and try and rationalize the business, get it, do less deals, but, but make more money. And luckily I was quite good at that because I've been like learned the hard way how to make money. So yeah, so we did, we sold we sold a lot of companies. Marion had a lovely niche. I more or less ran it. It was a TMT, technology media software. So we sold a good few software companies, sold a lot of media companies, FM 104, uh, Light FM, lots of regional newspapers. It was lots, it was great. 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. There was a lot of activity. In Big run up there. Yeah. You, your, your timing was right. You'd sensed it at the right time. Yeah, it was good. You were able to, you said follow the action. You, you'd follow the action right in at the start yeah. of the action. Has so that been a that's been a kind of a characteristic for you? Is it? Yeah. Look, ever, ever since even then, is that look, eventually got out of corporate finance and knew enough. If you spend too long in corporate finance, you feel you're the, you're the bacon or the ham and the ham slicer. <laughs> slice, slice, slice. It's great. I think everybody should work in corporate finance five or six years. You learn so much. You learn how to raise money. You learn how to sell a company. You learn how to buy a company. You get paid very well as you go along. So it's great, but I don't think you should stay too long in it because you're always the middleman and you're seeing these entrepreneurs, you're helping them along to sell their company, go back to go. Always so the bridesmaid, never the bride. Yeah, exactly. So eventually, yeah. 2010, I thought I had enough of this. That was 10 years in corporate finance or nine years to be exact. And I set up a company called Fastened Oil and Gas. We IPO'd it. And long story short, we did three more IPOs. So now our model is just basically do one IPO every year or two. It takes a year or two to get ready and do a rapid IPO, put it on the London stock market, usually the AM market, and occasionally, as an amateur, we dual listed in NASDAQ. Okay, we skip forward there a lot. <laughs> <laughs> How do you go from being the middleman, being the ham, you're in the, in the sandwich now, to starting an oil and gas company? We rented a room. We had a small building around the corner in Fitzwilliam Place. We Raglan Capital was up and coming, pretty good corporate finance firm with about 15 or 20 young finance guys and girls working for us. How do you mean? You started a new company? You yeah, started we Raglan? sold Marion, so I set up Raglan Capital. Right. We've kept it since. So when Marion got bought by our Icelandic friends, we all got a few quid, nothing life-changing. But Marion got successfully sold in 2006. 2007, I left and took 
most of the corporate finance business with me. A bit with a deal with Marion, I, I sh- shared deals. Okay. So I continued. It was more Ragnum was more the same, exact same I was doing in Marion stock. Okay, so you spun that off into a different company. Spun it right. off. Okay. And then did Ragland Capital from 2007 to 2010, and around 2010, uh, was we had a building and we had sublet, and some guys uh, were setting up a small oil and gas company called Cove Energy. It was listed in London, um, a market cap of two hundred and fifty thousand pounds, microscopic, sharp price one pound. So we, they came into the office. We give them a cheap room because they had no money. I helped them introduce them some stump brokers in London. Our friends in Dublin, Davies, wouldn't have anything to do with them. What were they were trying to do, these lads? They were trying to set up a small oil and gas company. There's a guy called John Craven. He died recently, but he was an, a veteran oil and gas guy. So he had a good name. Uh, and Michael Nolan, cut a long story short, I helped bring him into Senko's in London, the guy Joan Alley. Introduced him. Long story short, I took off like a rocket. Now, I was only in the background as an advisor. I uh, never made any money on that deal, but it was sold 33 months later for 1.7 billion. Share price went from 1p to £1.76. So it was 176 uplift. I mean, one of the most successful Irish companies ever. Jesus. 33 months. So they were a tenant. So they Let me just get my head around that. 33 months. 33 months. It was 250k market cap. Market cap. Sold for 1.7 billion. Now along the way they raised quite a they raised a couple couple of tranches, 50 million, 10 million, and 120 at one stage. So but cut long story short, it was a phenomenally successful Cove Energy. Loads of people bought new cars, quite a few people in Dublin bought new houses out of it. But anyway, the two founders felt sorry. So God, you know, you did a lot of work for us here. You haven't messed with shares. I've a rule never buy shares if you think you've insider information. It's just no insider trading. Nobody's allowed in the office. So that goes from back to the Marion days. So they said, how about you get out of this corporate finance business, we'll set up a company called Fastnet, you run it. So that was 2011, we set up Fastnet. Sorry, just to pull something out there, you know, you, your code, you have a code. What's that? You have a code. I think all good entrepreneurs have a code. This is what we do, this, oh, is, what yeah. we, this is what we do not do. Yeah. I'm starting to see that, like there's strong traits among certain entrepreneurs. This is how I live. Yeah, look. These at my, are my black yeah, and whites. Look, my view is don't do anything. It's a very simple code. Goes back to forty-two years ago in Donegal. Don't do something you wouldn't like to see splashed across the front page of the Irish Times. And within that, insider trading. So we've a rule: we're always dealing with public companies. Nobody in the office that works are allowed to buy or sell shares. Public companies to do, we fire them. We create public companies, and we get a stake ourselves. And that's how we make our money. So long story short, the Cove Energy guys, I never bought or sold shares in them, and it went through the roof. So they felt a little bit sorry. I said, Kyle, you did a lot of help in the background. We'll set you up in Fastnet. So I knew not... So the they'd exit out now at this stage? They'd exit. They were in the exit process because we set up Fastnet. So I was executive chairman, hands-on, chief bottle washer. We IPO'd in London uh, at 3 or 4p. Did really well, 10 million. Got it up to 3x, 30 million. Got it as far as 100 million. Small cap. Public companies can really take off. Why? What, what, how, sorry, go back to this. You said set up uh, an oil and gas company. Surely that costs millions, if not hundreds no, of millions. No, actually, small public companies, particularly on the AIM market in London, a couple of million gets you up and running. Because you basically, we would have picked up licenses in the industry, same in the pharma. You acquire a license. There's usually no money up front. You go to a government somewhere and say, look, we will take this license for two years. We promise to do the following amount of work. If we don't do it, they take the license back. So you're getting an area, is it? Yeah, an area for exploration. How do you um, how do you even pick that? How do where you we had some cove, had some really good exploration people. So set up Fastnet, did it. Oil price collapsed, raised a lot of money, and we asked permission to shareholders to get out of oil and gas because the oil price came from one twenty six dollars to twenty six in four, 2014. Yeah. 90 percent drop. You can't make money with a drop. We looked around. Uh, asked people, and they said, well, pharmaceuticals is not a bad place. We got permission of the shareholders. We changed Fastness' name to Amrit Pharma. Got ridiculed, got dogs abuse. He said, hang on, we've never seen an oil and gas company become pharma. It's an odd move, to be fair. Yeah, but it's again ballsy and kind of, if we'd thought it through, we probably wouldn't have done it. Found a fantastic CEO. At this stage, I knew how to raise money because I had done my corporate finance era. Uh, a guy called Joe Wiley, who'd be between jobs, he'd been let go. He was running a venture fund here. We had Joe in the office for six or nine months with us. We tried to find deals, got a German deal. Then there was another guy in Dublin called Roy Nealon, who we knew had taken a year off. 
and got him together with Joe, and the two of them got on like a house on fire. And Amrit went on to list in London. We IPO'd it in London in 2016. It IPO'd in NASDAQ in 2019. And then uh, earlier this year, it got bought for $1.5 billion cash. Now, I didn't. I got a sliver of a sliver because I was selling shares and doing anything else, mm-hmm. and we raised a lot of money. But the management team, Joe, got a very large return. So did Rory. And more importantly, our investors, we put in, got five, six times the money. And then along the way, going back to what happened, I found getting that CEO was critical. So you set in the business, you've got to find the CEO and the CFO. I thought, these two guys, I'll trust them. So I thought I could do it again. And we spun, went off, got off the board and said, right, I've done one public company facet, which I knew nothing about oil and gas, but it was okay. It was a success. People made money. I did a second public company, Amrit, IPO'd it. And I had a fantastic, say, two guys running it, trusted them. And I had a large part of my net worth. My wife thought it was absolute nuts. Hang on, why are you stepping back? I said, these guys, they know what they're doing. And set up Open Orphan. That would have been 2018. We IPO'd it in 2019. And that one I stayed very hands-on because we couldn't find a proper CEO. So I had to be the acting CEO. We acquired Venn. We acquired HVivo in December 2019. And it's been reasonably successful as well, actually, as a public company. How are you able to transition so fast and so succinctly? Like, there's not a shred of doubt in your voice. You're one of the most direct, confident people. And we have a lot of confident people across this table. Like, you just seamlessly go from one to one, even if it's a hard a hard U-turn. How have you done that so well? It goes well? back to how I started. I think humans are risk takers. We all take risks because we did our cousin's non-risk takers stayed up the trees the Mm. monkeys we take risks some other humans the entrepreneurs i I think i'm definitely an entrepreneur take more risk but not reckless risks but a big part of it probably stands by me i had to go back to school and education at night while running a fairly tricky complicated business johnny goal so the big part i do a lot of reading uh i don't say not work reading home but i do a lot of reading so i want to go into a new space and i have a couple of colleagues who do the exact same a guy called ian o'connell he's a machine he read 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 he helped me set up amrit it was an orphan drugs we didn't know what orphan drugs was then we were two years later we were giving talks on them um so do a lot of reading understand it and like we're even pivot in the moment we've done another public company called pool bag and we're getting kind of bored they're all in great shape we're about to go into the green metal space. So green metals are the alloys and things required. So we're both reading up and lots of YouTube videos, things, and seeing how what goes into a, a lithium iron battery. I love that because like people look at you, and go, that guy, yeah, he just knows it all. But really, you're just grinding as hard as everyone read, else. Read and the, oh no, look, uh, the big one is some people are lucky. And if there's that, but most people are not. You no. just have to. No, I not. think Margaret Thatcher said that the harder she worked, the luckier she got. A hundred percent, that's true. There's there's absolutely zero doubt about that. Because if you're just sitting there, the luck will not come. If you're out there no. grinding, moving from space to space to opportunity to opportunity, that's luck. And the, the big one is keep trying things, but don't be reckless. I think having debt is risky. Businesses must be cash, equity, something you can afford to lose. Once you acquire debt, you can't really take risks. So I just think, but most entrepreneurs, they're good at not, they're good at managing risks, they're good at managing the worry piece. But the biggest thing, what I think I just do, just go do it, give it a go. Don't Mm -hmm. think about it too long. I remember being in the talk, Dennis O'Brien, he said, a business plan that takes more than two days to write is out of date. He said, don't spend, he said, meet so many people, spend six months drafting this business plan. He says, two pages of paper, two days. If it doesn't work, if you can't raise money, that don't do it. So that's exactly what we do, is that uh, pull a plan together, a couple of pages, concept. We'll probably fund it yourself. If you can't explain it to a few people in two pages, don't do it. I, I, I do a lot of exercise of it with students in Trinity about this very thing, because if you can't explain it succinctly, you don't know what you're talking about. It's that old three-minute elevator pitch. And the Americans are great, but look, the Americans are great salespeople. You meet a guy in the elevator or a girl, if you can't explain your business between floors... It's not happening. Yeah, and uh, so I get them to get them to explain it just broadly about three minutes. Then I get them to do thirty seconds. Then I get them to do a sentence. Yeah. Over the course of three hours, I get them from three minutes down to one sentence. And actually, on that, I'm teaching my fifteen-year-old, thirteen-year-old, a junior cert guy to mind for the next couple of weeks. My wife is away, but the simplest and they're loving it. 
when I look at something, and this goes back to the time I was a lecturer trying to crack the exam papers, you should write down the five key words in the answer, put them in your paper, and when the lecturer, the student's correcting them, say, oh, there's the five key words, I don't have to read the answer. So the same with business plans, there's usually five or six key points. For instance, the critical metal business, rather than explain and say, yeah, we have a business called Euro Green Metals, we're going to IPO early next year, Euro Green Metals. So it's green metals, We'll find them in Europe for European consumption. And that's it. That's the business. Does what it says in the tin. Yeah, European green metals. The name, actually, we spent a long time getting a name that resonates. European green metals for Europe. Find in Europe, produce them in Europe for Europe. We could do a whole 60-minute pod about you explaining that idea because it's one of those ideas that's so big, right? And it's important because this and it's important because that and blah, blah, blah. But in 30 seconds, you just told everyone what it is. Yeah. And we understand and we get it. That's our next IPO. <laughs> there's a you heard it here first. There's a beauty in that, right? Yeah. There's, yeah. An, there's yeah. an art and Simpl- a skill. Look, I think in business, entrepreneurs, they're really good at distilling things down. That elevator pitch, you've got to do And look, the Americans have do your elevator pitch. And where the elevator pitch came from, you've got the time between the first floor and the second floor. It's usually a lot less than three minutes. That's where the name, entrepreneurs, you've got to do your elevator pitch. So it is to do with Americans. You grab somebody in an elevator. So yeah, yeah, it probably goes back to New York. I'd say back in the, the Wall Street like days. That. Yeah, maybe the slow elevator. So I'd say the big know, wire the, doors, the, the doors, the doors. Yeah, the wire doors yeah. and the James Bond. You can get the hatch through the top. You, did you know that actually? The band, uh, all elevators the last 35, 40 years. You're not allowed to have the hatch. You can climb up. So many people got killed because when the elevator went up. The guy thought he's being James Bond. He opened the door. There was a service access most elevators just like the, the movies yeah and then the problem is when it goes up but they don't show in james bond it goes up solid against the work and the irons and people died wow so the elevator pitch that door in an elevator is now illegal you, you cannot have the service hatch because the too many wannabe james bonds got seriously injured or killed by going up there well, that is a random stat we've we've yeah. crammed into this yeah, pod the elevator pitches there you go dangerous of elevator pitches yeah How, where is this energy come from how because like, literally i feel energized talking to you like where does this drive come from or what is it driving you probably near death experience i would call it like emotionally everything i think got the best thing ever happened to me in Donegal that near death i call it near death professionally leaving school watching that bus go by for years and all my colleagues on it and then watching my family younger brothers and sisters go to university i had to keep grinding out the business to pay the bills I think when I escape from that, you say, wow, couldn't get any worse. I drink a lot of water, actually. I think water. And also, I'm now 58. I've found the last five, six, seven years, around three, four, five o'clock, even now we're at whatever time, you get that dead patch. I take a lot of vitamins, and I find that particularly, there's a, a pun for somebody in Galway, but it's actually everybody, we supply to loads of people. There's a thing called Revive Active, a green sachet. See it everywhere, yeah. Uh, yeah, and... I'm addicted to it. I can't. I stopped taking it for two weeks. My annual holiday is two weeks. Later. I stopped taking it then, and I die. Uh, I get lose energy. So, yeah, I think really healthy foods. I'm quite particular about my diet. I keep Talk thinking. to me. I love my diet. I'm, I'm almost anal about my diet. Talk to me. Well, Talk, until, tell me about about, until about 15 years ago, I'd never eat red meat. I used to like fish, like chicken. And I would love a bit of steak and a bit of meat. But I avoid, because I always thought, going back to this thing, uh, humans come down from the trees because we start to eat meat. I don't think humans are naturally vegetarian. Our cousins are vegetarians. Monkeys are vegetarians. Humans ate meat somewhere, so our brain got big, that statistically. But I think your diet should resemble the hunter-gatherers. Hunter-gatherers, two million years ago, three million, before we became cavemen, before we start farming, uh, used to, well, actually even cavemen. The cavemen, the, hunter-gatherer, the traditional hunter-gatherer human used to live to 75 years. Our life expectancy then, 10,000 years, dropped to 45 or 50 because hunter-gatherers were out in the fresh air, running around, very healthy, very fit, but they were living of beads, seeds, fruit, nuts, and animals, proteins, and milk. Uh, so what happened was for about 10,000 years, we could start living off single diets, wheat, potatoes. Our diet. So I think the big one, I find a real variety of diet. Early in the morning, I take some uh, muesli, Used to be porridge, go through fats. Now it's muesli, sesame seeds, pumpkin seeds. I've had this whole drive my wife mad and kids. I've this box of stuff, but loads of different seeds in. Got to like them, uh, so it has to be seeds, nuts, fruits, and a bit of muesli, and that's my breakfast. Well, we have a whole shelf with like 
chia seeds, nuts, sunflower yeah, good seeds, stuff. all cashew nuts, and all that, a full press of it. But no, that's what I think. So that's one way of energy. I just think so. Avoid carbohydrates in the morning. That gets me going. Lots of coffee to 11. Absolutely no coffee after 11. That's the big thing. Coffee is really? a stimulant. It takes 12 hours. My medical experience in clinical trials it takes 12 hours to flush caffeine out of your system. Mm. No green tea, no white tea, no black tea, no coffee, no chocolate, no Coke. They all got caffeine. That means the minute I go to bed, which is usually between 11 and 12, you're asleep in 30 seconds. Instant sleep. And you get that magic four or five hours to bed, three or four in the morning, when a guy of 58, you've got to go up and go to the bathroom. But I go back to sleep again. But you get that really powerful four or five hours deep sleep. If I drink coffee, you're twisting and turning and twisting and turning. So I, I generally get away with six. I like sleep. But you get a really good sleep. So I never wake up tired. If I drink coffee, eat chocolate after 12, one, two, three, four, you don't get the same deep, deep sleep. So that gives me energy. Okay. Uh, what about the rest that? of your day for the diet? What are we What are we eating? What are we having? Uh, relatively healthy-ish, small meal, lunchtime, small, lots of small meals. I don't like big, big meals. I yeah. don't like big starchy meals. So yeah, lots picky. I'd be a complete grazer. Do you exercise? Uh, walk and walk. I hate going to the gym. Really? But, and for the last seven, eight years, I've got a lovely routine. My time, young kids, you'll understand this in a few months' time. I get up at half five, quarter to six. Sounds terrible. That's what I do. And clear off out of the house. I live out near Dunleary and walk 7K round trip to the end of the West Pier and back. Nice. But uh, quite a, but that hour and a half, I don't walk fast. It takes me an hour and a half, an hour and 20 minutes to do it. Stop along the way. There's a late night or overnight filling station stays open. Have a coffee. Listen to my music or listen now to audiobooks. But that hour and 20 minutes is my reasonably quick walk, but it's 7K most days, Saturday, Sunday. Saturday, Sunday, I have a lie, and I don't do it till 7 o'clock, but during the week, I it. But that's the only fitness I do. But I absolutely love it. No people say you're not getting enough exercise. You're not walking fast, but do the do it. It compounds. Week. Yeah, it compounds. I wear a whoop. Um, and you see, I love going to the gym. I love exercising hard, but walking. Yeah, no, no, it I love it. Really walking. works. But it clears your head, and it's my time. I go back in the chaos of the young kids in the morning, or even in London. I work in London two days every week. I have my gear, get up and do a big walk around the, around the Thames River, go up one bridge down the other, do my 6, 7K. I just, no, that's my little treat because I love listening to audiobooks. I've got obsessed with audiobooks. Really? Yeah, I go through, oh, upset. And my wife goes mad. She spends all her life reading novels. I think I read three novels in my life ever because I prefer reading. Are you a reader? Absolutely, frenetic reader. But as you use scientific journals, things to do at work these days, reading loads about electric batteries, electric cars. So I love that sort of just curious reader. So you, do you go deep on no, like a no, specific s- area? You, you want to get into an area. We're now getting involved in, like pharmaceuticals had to get very experienced and read a lot about pharmaceuticals and viral development. Yeah, so I do a lot of read. I don't go into massive reading but a lot it's almost broad uh, and comprehensive mm. and that's look in the morning there's so many wonderful audiobooks like there's one at the moment called volt tells you all about how the electric battery works so i love going into meetings now telling people who are and explain to them the exact mechanism of a lithium iron battery and how a little bit of cobalt works better and do 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 and he said why'd you read that i said i didn't i just listened to it in an audiobook as I walked along. But you're able to process, you're able to keep that in. Yeah, yeah when well you fast forward, it gets, boring, it gets boring. And it's subliminal. You, you're, you can, as you walk along and you're enjoying, th- it's a good time. Other people are better at reading novels. And then occasionally for fun, I read a, a racy novel and drive my wife mad. Where do you get time to read the novels? And I'd come back, she, and she'd tell her, friend, don't listen to them. He doesn't read the books, he listens to them. And they say, well, he has a storyline. Yeah, it's, just, it's the same. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Like, I, I, I can't fully get into audiobooks. I love podcasts. I listen to podcasts probably two, three hours a day. But I love reading a book. I love reading yeah. to actually write on it, to scribble on it. Well, my comics, what I love, I get, a, I get comics, uh, which is The Economist. That's my big comic. I, I scan through it. I have that one comes. I don't know where this is going. Yeah, so that's how I call my comics wife. Because every time I go on holidays, I take a bundle of them. It's uh, The Economist every week. That's my comic. And then the other one is I get New Scientist. And I have that posted to the house in one of the other kids' name. And then Nature Magazine. Is in those, so that's my three comics. Now, you don't get a chance to read them. A lot of like colour pictures and things. Them, but New Scientist, Nature. D- now, there's a lot of heavy-duty research, but you can scan it. So that's my comic reading. As a kid, we have comics. And I think learning to read comics is a great skill because you get older. Economists have lots of nice colour pictures and diagrams and things. But you read, there's great fun. Some of the stuff you read is fascinating. And either The Economist, New Scientist, or Nature Magazine. What do you do for your mind? You, we've talked about the body. What, how do you look after your mind? Take drugs. 
<laughs> no, that's, Open that's one cool thing. Open up, cool break. No, I, I, <laughs> yeah, is, no, the one thing I've never done, I just think the best drugs in the world is red wine. That's my one drug. Love okay. red wine. Um, for the mind, I think that walking clears the mind in the morning. Proper night's sleep. I do like a good night's sleep. Mm. Like I get the bed. Like I'd never have this rule. I'm, um, what do you call them? Um, midnight, uh, what do you call the princess? Prince, what do you call the princess? Or what's oh, her name? Um, Cinderella. Cinderella. I'm a Cinderella. No matter where in the world I am, 12 o'clock. That's late I'm though. Late. 12 is late to go to bed, uh, right? If you're up no, at 6, what time are you up at 6? Yeah, 6. A bit so five and a half, six, 6 hours is enough. That's just, that's, but that's just really, bear in mind, the minute my head hits the pillow, 30 seconds out for the count. Mm. Kids think it's really funny. That is rare to be fair. Yeah. yeah, and it doesn't matter if that's 10, 11, 12, 30 seconds, deep sleep. Um, so for the mind, that sleep is really important. If I'm not getting sleep, I try and fix it uh, by what's causing it. So like if there's something bugging me, I'll try and write it down. Mm. What else? Mind being perfectly honest, taking the reactive, it's good for the mind. I think it calms you and gives you energy. And making sure I unwind the weekend with the chaos of the kids. Mm. And what else, mind? And, uh, oh yeah, I'm just always conscious that the mind is the most fragile part of your body. People do, like I've, I have two sisters who are manic depressive, schizophrenic, medically, and they've never worked, so I'm very conscious. Both of them up to 16 were perfectly normal kids. Mm -hmm. My older sister's only a year older. We went to school, I left early, mine up to 16, absolutely unblemished, broken Achilles tendon, anyway rest of history she's manic depressive schizophrenic all her life so i just think the mind is such a fragile mm. so people should be careful i just should treat it like you watch your hand you don't make sure it's damaged i think when your mind i've been looking very lucky the mind's never got damaged on me but you have to watch out for i think you should watch your head like mm. sometimes i'm doing something at work and pushing people i say you sure your head's okay and i just just watch the old head here just look don't 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 injure yourself mm. so but i think it's the basics there it's all the stuff you've said about the book the bag at the door the sleep the having the code having the switch off like and all that combined of water i drink uh, a liter and a half every i just think water is uh, is like your body needs it yeah it's an overrunner i, I yeah. force myself to drink loads of water yeah but it's what we're made up of right yeah we're nearly all liquid so you've got a playbook now you've clearly got a playbook of these businesses yeah, for setting them together. Yeah, and look, I'd say to any entrepreneur listening to your podcast, find out a way of raising money and not your own money. Not o You always find OPM, other people's money. I only can do it because I worked in Stockbroken. But if you want to be your own... But I, I think as well, uh, everybody should give it a go. The, but figure a point in time in your life when you haven't too many liabilities, either before you have kids or maybe slightly after your kids or, or dual, like I've spent half my life with two businesses, a day job and an evening job. So the evening, so most entrepreneurs, if you can't get the money, do it as a part-time job at the weekend or evenings. Don't kill yourself. So I think everybody should give a go. No, it's not entrepreneur. I keep thinking my own three kids in the morning walks. I keep thinking, would I encourage any of them to do what I do? Probably not. There's Interesting. There is, there, is, there is consequences. Why not? Like the big one is um, your social life surface suffers. Uh, your family life tends to suffer a little bit as well because like during the week I don't see much of my family. I, Monday, Friday, I have simple routines, but Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the kids don't mind. I'm not generally around. And I have this thing, if I do it again, I'd never do it. I'd live my life again. I have no regrets because I don't do the regret business. But if you'd ask me what would you do if you weren't doing this, I just think I'd love to be a teacher. Or a lecture. I did lecturing for five years and I loved it. Throwing chalk at 300 kids who wouldn't listen to you and you'd get a Coke can and say, what's this guy on? Get their attention. Or I think a community social worker doing things and helping others. But being an entrepreneur, you're helping others. But it, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'd highly recommend it to Okay, kids. riddle me this then. Why are you still doing it? Because I love it. The game. Yeah, it's a bit like the fishing. The game. Why do you people go fishing? You drop a line in the water and you know it'd be much cheaper to go to the fishmonger and just buy it. It's the game of the unexpectedness. Because obviously you've done quite well. You've, you've had multiple exits and you, you know you, you could probably retire now. Uh, no, not, not yet. Not yet, no. Our, our management team in Amrit and Wind Up, they can retire. They got the big money at Amrit. I got a, a little slice, but I have to keep going. I forget the Amrit exit. I would you do. must have a big goal. What's that? You must have a big goal. No, I look, I've got, it's always good and good. For, I do, look, being honest, I don't think I'll ever retire. I quite enjoy doing what I'm doing. What I probably can imagine, 
I currently work five days a week. It's always nice. Some day I'd like to work four days a week, then three days, then two days. But I think till the day I die, I'll work two or three days a week. And you're in London twice a week? Twice most weeks, yeah, two days. What's that for? Most, again, where's the money? We've raised hundreds of millions for different projects. We have four public companies I've helped create. Uh, and that's where the big money is. You start, entrepreneurs, I keep saying, you want to start, you may find a way of getting that money. Try and do OPM, other people's money. Uh, that's usually around here in Dublin. Uh, all our projects, we have a club of people who come in, put money into our projects that trust us now. As soon as IPO is two years, they can sell out or they can buy more. That's the beauty. Public companies are the opposite of private. Private companies like Hotel California, you can check in, you can check out. Public companies that we do what we do, we've done it four times, trust us with your money, and 18 months, you can sell the shares in the IPO. Uh, so that's that. But the reason I go to London, the bigger money is there. There used to be a, a very active Irish stock market called the Irish stock market. Uh, there used to be almost hundreds of companies have slowly, CRH this week has gone off to America. What's the crack there? Because I've read multiple articles and I can't get my head around it. What's well, the story with that? Well, being frank and very simple, now I'm going to cause a bit of trouble in this. I've done four IPOs in Ireland. I could never once get any of that. I won't mention names. They know who they are. Never once could I get an Irish stockbroker to show a remote interest in what I was doing. I don't know, not big enough for us, not doing this. Amrit now is 1.5 billion. I'm currently doing a green metals. And again, the same result. Oh God, that's look, green metals too complicated. To this, you ring a single London stockbroker down, and they harass you. I have had three missed calls a day from two different. Call, I heard you're doing green metals. Can we be your broker? What has happened in the Irish market? It's a bit like Ireland generally. The Irish brokers got too fat, made too much money on multi-billion CRHs. They didn't fill the hopper of saplings. If you keep cutting the trees down and you don't set the young trees, what happens? Look That's at Easter stones. Island. Yeah. Easter Island in the Pacific, those big stones, was the most green island in the Pacific. The lads kept chopping the tree down to build the big stones, and then suddenly there's no trees. So the problem with that, but I think the Irish stock market has this window, and hopefully my stockbroken friends are listening. I've done four IPOs, and I'm a nobody. Like, generally, I'm nobody. I'm a guy from the country. I didn't go to Blackrock College. I didn't do used to have no network, but I've managed to pull off four IPOs. The Irish stock market is entering terminal decline. CRH is gone, Paddy Power is going. You need to set the trees. Um, the four trees we set, they didn't want us. That's Let's be frank. And they, there were always a million excuses. Even we're doing something at the moment to try, and it could be very big, to try and elicit interest. There's too much easier money to make in Ireland uh, than to help young. But I think the stock markets, I think the existing stock brokers have a choice. Do the kids want to work in stockbroke and do they want an Irish stock market? If they do, they need to help other Cahill Freel type people say, look, we will bring the early stage funding, we'll wrap the cotton wool. Think of the following, Kingspan. I was involved in that IPO. Kingspan IPO'd in late 80s. It was a smaller than some of my companies. It was probably, I think it was raised a 10 million IPO, market cap 10. Now it's multi-billion. If I tried to start Kingspan today in Dublin, the stockbrokers would run me out of town, go to London, okay? So I think it's the Irish stockbrokers have to realise you can't, it doesn't become a billion right away. You've got to plant the trees. Public companies, I love them. You can get from, if you think of it, Amrit was 10 million market cap, six years ago sold for 1.5 billion. Open Orphan, we IPO'd at 8 million market cap. It's about 120 million now four years later. Public, so I think the Irish stockbrokers, Ireland now could be doing six, seven IPOs every year for the next few years. Think in 97, 98, there was a whole, there was Iona Technologies, mm. there was Horizon, there was Baltimore, a whole TMT boom, Bank River Deep, CBT. You did different breed of stockbrokers then who really encouraged them. So hopefully, I mean, I'm talking to the stockbrokers who are hopefully listening to me, mm. guys and girls, if you don't plant the trees, I've planted four trees. They've all grown up pretty well, but I unfortunately did it all by myself, my small team. And luckily, the London stockbrokers are vastly keener and hungry. And then we've been a phone call, and you ask why I spend two days a week in London. That's where the money is. The stockbrokers there are embrace small cap IPOs. The Irish stockbrokers, unless it's two, three, four hundred million, not wanted here, unfortunately. That's now, hopefully, I'm hoping reality kicks in and now stockbrokers say hey this 15 20 
guys and girls in Ireland could do IPOs, let's help them. Mm. But no, at the moment is, yeah, go and do your IPO in London. And when you're half a billion, we'll give you a hand. It's kind of, life's not that simple, guys. Should be the other way, right? Because surely you should be going to London when you've got that that, that stage. Like, surely no, no, you should London, be the other look, way, right? Very, very, it's great. London, you turn up in London, there's a, th- again, it's competition, maybe. There's probably about, ooh, what do we call it, 150, 200 kind of broker types who'll do an IPO for you in London. We're down to two. So it's kind of, you no, know, if you take out the competition, uh, why are they hungry in London? Because uh, there's 50 more, 100 more can do your j- do the same job. Whereas here, we've got three, uh, three stock brokers, that's it. So, Talk to me about a Bluebird deal. Yeah, I've one rule in life, and this goes back to marine stock brokers. Uh, the review and stock or corporate finance, it's called a Bluebird, a deal that's unexpected comes in through the window. So if somebody approaches me with an idea or an opportunity, I usually pass on it because it's been shopped around. All my deals in life I've found, virtually every one, is something we've thought up, created, chased, done ourselves. And this is a small group of us. A bluebird is something that just comes through the door. And it's usually, we get lots of bluebirds. People ring it, Carl, can I show you something? Carl, can I show you? Carl, can you look at that? I never get involved in them. And the reason is, somebody will get involved in them, but it's been shopped around Anything we do, particularly if you has to be unique, it has to be cheap, it has to be something special, and you usually can do that yourself. Where are you hunting? You're gonna. We talked about earlier about hunting deals. Where, do, where? How do you hunt? Our playground is Europe and North America, believe it or not. And this sounds a bit arrogant. The guy from Donegal who used to sell cars, but yeah, each deal brings us forward. In the past three weeks, I was in Zagreb. I was Turkey of all places last three weeks. I was in Sweden. Last three weeks, London a few times, and I'm going to Aberdeen on Tuesday. That's hunting down deals. I'm not, uh, this is cheap and cheerful, Ryanair flights, staying in crappy hotels, but following down leads and opportunities to find assets, basically. So, and a lot of this is just conceptually. We put vehicles together, fasteners put together, because oil price hit through $100, hadn't happened in years, that was 2010. Oil price collapsed. There's loads of money going to the pharma. We did a couple of pharma deals. Now there's a green transition, so we're trying to put ideas and concepts together that will ec- will capitalize upon the green economy. Mm-hmm. So we're not leaving pharmaceuticals. Love the sector. In life science, we have HBO, we have Pool Bag. Hopefully, Pool Bag will be going on NASDAQ. We've been guiding the market for a while. That could really take off. But we are actively looking with a small team of people I've known for a long number of years in the mining space. It's a bit like I said earlier, that European green metals is finding green metals, critical metals in Europe for European consumption. And then you've got a proper green car. That's interesting you, because people think, you said something about electric car earlier, we think it's you know eco and it's green, but to get to your doorstep, it's got to come from China, it's had to be mined from China, it's had to be mined in Africa. It's actually not... An ID4 Volkswagen, which is purely electric, supposed to be the most green car in Europe, the carbon footprint is far worse than a diesel Golf, believe it or not, because everything in that ID4 is coming from China, Chile, South Africa, uh, whereas the diesel Golf, the steel is mined in Europe, it's milled in Europe, it's the diesel engine, so the carbon footprint iron over the lifetime. Uh, so that's where the ID4, that electric Volkswagen, that's all battery, the need to find the lithium in Europe, the cobalt in Europe, the rare earths in Europe, and that's we've set a business up to go do that. Because there is, Finland's got loads of cobalt. You tell the world, oh, it's all in Democratic Republic of Congo. The easy to get stuff there. There's lo- there is cobalt. There's actually allegedly cobalt here in Ireland. Allegedly. You'll find out. Mm. We'll do a quick fire round. Carl, what book would you recommend every entrepreneur should read? Getting up. So you, you forewarned me this, for, so rather than delay, and the quick book I remember that clearly is the Nike book, and there's actually a fantastic book by Phil Nike. It's called uh, Shoe Dog. Shoe Dog. It's, it's amazing. amazing. He started with nothing, and is out of college, 24 years. He had a terrible 20 years, but he got there. But the first 10 years, he was renting deck chairs for his office. He was borrowing cars. But, hey, he's one of the richest guys in the world now. But he started Quality. with nothing. He had no money, but he knew the OPM. He knew a few rich people. He could shake them down for other people's money. So, yes, that's that one. Brilliant. Shoe dog. In your personal life, what thing do you spend money on that dramatically increases your happiness? I think you know the answer to that yourself. It's called kids. Like, there's no, believe it or not, there's no <laughs> fun spending money on yourself. There's only so much you can do. Yeah. But I love spending money on my wife, kids. Wife's gone off for three weeks around Taiwan and Singapore as her 50th birthday present. Like, it, 
I'll have far more fun. She goes off and enjoys herself. She's taking it. So vast majority of spending on other people and random spending on total strangers. Every now and again, you see a lost American in Dublin. Saw one yesterday. I do it every week or two where you're going, oh, I'm stressed, trying to find the American embassy. Let me get you a taxi, put him in. What's your name? Never mind. Just get in the taxi. And you see, what was that about? So random, random general and you keep thinking someday I'll be an old lost Irish guy somewhere and somebody will put me in a taxi and that's wild so you just do that random acts of kindness every week or two I think the guys in the office think I'm nuts you see it's always some random stranger and you just put them in a the taxi or help them or do something that's just that's a great way and I just think spending money on yourself is kind of boring like it's like eating sweets you get sick of it after a while I love that what have you sacrificed to achieve your success? I probably touched on the area. I think most entrepreneurs, everyone, has basically social life, friends, hobby, family life. But you, you work around that. What would you do today if I give you 10 million euro? What would you spend it on? That's a good one. I'd probably invest a third in pool bag because that's the one we think we have. No, it's not. We're going to try and get pool bag pharma onto NASDAQ. We have Luke and Neil in there with big plans. And then I'd do two more IPOs because I probably can't get the three million of Davies and Good Buddies won't give it to me. So I put a, I can do two IPOs, but six million. So one third into pool bag, one third in a critical metals IPO, and one third in maybe a podcasting IPO or something. And you, but a three million I'll is more. I'll than take a call. IPO. We're in. If you were an entrepreneur, what would you be doing? Oh, very simple. I absolutely love the five years I was a part time lecturer in the University of Ulster. I think, and I'm at a stage where I'm encouraging kids. I would love to be a teacher. Or the other one, I did do a good bit of work with the probation service in Donegal 25 years ago, doing a voluntary instructor weekend, mining probation kids. So I actually think of it to start again. I would love to be a social worker in the community. It's so rewarding to see these kids who are having a hard time, and you're kind of giving them a little lift. That's interesting, that. I'm going to get you into Trinity. I'm going to hook you in for Tangent next year, so I'm going to hold you to that. Sounds good to me. If I was going to give you 1 million euros today, you only put it into one company or one person, what would you spend it in? One million, um, yeah, I, I think I probably said this earlier, it's a broken record, but only one company, pull back, because it's definitely, the, of all the things working on it, that's probably the one with the biggest buying upside at the moment. Okay. And after that, maybe, our next green metals venture. You've kind of answered this question, if you're going to start a new company in the morning, say, beyond what you're starting now, what would it be? Yeah, look, I would say, where's the money going? We, I have no original thought. No, I just find, where's the money? There's loads of money going to the conversion from the hydrocarbon economy to the green economy. So find a piece in that, and that's where I would go. That's we follow. It's like Jerry Maguire. Either show me the money or follow the money. That's what entrepreneurs do, and we follow the money. The money is going green. Let's build a few green businesses. Love it. Don't overthink it. What do you believe that other people might find strange or disagree with? Yeah, probably the one thing I drive everybody insane is I just, just go and do it. And I say, why not think? I just, so a lot of people think about it, procrastinate. So yeah, one thing that most, I just don't do too much of the planning, write a list down, give it a go. I don't do reckless things, always do it, try it. So yeah, some of you say, well, hang on a minute, don't go to you. I say, no, let's give it a go. And a lot of that involves, we're in trouble at work, something goes wrong, pick up the phone, just ring him. No, 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 let's think, no, no, ring him, don't talk among ourselves so i'd say it's back to that obama thing just do it or maybe that's the, the nike, nike thing. Yeah, yeah phil knight if you to make 100 quid in the morning you've got to make 100 euro can't use any of your current resources what are you going to do if you to make 100 euros in the morning oh i read this one wrong if you, if you had to make uh so i said to you right you've got to go out in the morning you've got to come back with 100 quid at the end of the day you can't use any of your current resources your network your talents you can use your talents but you can't use your networks or any any resources you already have Got to get 100 quid. How are you getting it? That's a tricky one. I actually, probably you just find somebody needs help somewhere. Uh, like the simple one is that you go, hey, can I cut your lawn? Cut the lawn. There's do a few lawn cuts because you know everybody needs a lawn cut. Yeah, cut the lawn for somebody. That's instant money. Every young or entrepreneur starts there. Yeah, trim the trees. We had a great entrepreneur in earlier and he was talking about um, when he was a kid, he used to live beside Crumlin Shopping Center. He used to go back and get the trolleys. People would be too lazy to bring them back. The euros. The He'd get euros. a euro. He made a hundred quid the week before Christmas because it was during a big snow once. Yeah, people left with the car. Yeah. Never underestimate human laziness. It's yeah. phenomenal. What is your one final bit of advice for every entrepreneur or aspiring entrepreneur listening? Yeah, probably start with one, the Nike, and just do it. That's literally, don't, don't procrastinate. You'll spend your life wishing you, nobody ever the same death looks back in which they didn't do things on your death doors 
you wish things you should have done. So I say, just do it. Give it a go. Give it a go. And that's the one thing. Give it a go. You'll never regret doing something. Most of your regrets are things you didn't do. Carl, that was a phenomenal hour. Thank you so much. It was a privilege to sit down with you. I do not take this for granted how busy you are and how important it is to get people like yourself on the pod because we really do try to get people at different stages of the game. And you are, whatever you want to say about being a boy from Donegal, you are one of the leaders in Ireland in the business space. So thank you for taking that time. Where can people learn a little bit more about you or the companies that you're working on? Gary, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Hopefully I'm part of the few words of wisdom, but I'm still learning. <laughs> and I'm still the boy from Donegal. So. so Pool Bag Pharma is the next one. Uh, f- if people need to contact you, LinkedIn, would that be the best it's platform? They've all got websites. They can know where to get it. It's, it's a public company. And then hopefully there's always another one coming around the corner. We are going green. So European green metals, we are lined up to IPO. And but like I said earlier, no Irish stockbroker wants to do the IPO. So we've got a bundle of London people banging down the door. We're ready to engage brokers in London to do the IPO. And it's a pity. It's a, I keep thinking, well, European green metals might be something very big. But no, nope, can't do it here in Ireland. But I can do it in London. It's already work in progress in London. Going to watch where that one goes. Carl, thank you so much. Gary's a pleasure. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Wherever you're listening, whether it's Spotify, YouTube, or Apple, click that subscribe button, and I will see you back here next week for a brand new podcast.